There is an epic battle happening right now between two technologies. The first is classical computing technology that has been around for about 70 years and is currently the most powerful and useful of the two. While classical computing has improved by leaps and bounds over the years, further advancement is getting more difficult as it pushes the limits of physics. The second is quantum computing technology that has been around for about 20 years. Quantum computing's potential is so great and the technology is so new, we have only scratched the surface on what can be done with the technology. And it's only a matter of time until a quantum computer will be able to be the best supercomputers at solving a problem. And this is the incredible moment when quantum supremacy is achieved. Lately, there has been many headlines about the race to quantum supremacy and Google claims to be close to achieving it. But before we explore what's going on with Google, let's quickly go over how a classical computer compares to a quantum computer. With a classical computer, the basic unit of information is a bit, which can represent a zero or a one. So take two bits from a classical computer. Those bits can be in four possible states, zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. And classical computers need to stack incredible amounts of bits to improve its processing power. The best supercomputers today have hundreds of trillions of bits. But with a quantum computer, the basic unit of information is a quantum bit, or qubit. Two qubits can represent the same four states of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1, but it can also represent all four states at the same time. This is because quantum computers harness the phenomenon of quantum mechanics called superposition. The second phenomenon of quantum mechanics that quantum computers harness is entanglement. And this is where things get incredible. For every qubit that is added to a quantum computer, the amount of potential states grows exponentially. The best classical supercomputers today with hundreds of trillions of bits can simulate a quantum computer of just 56 qubits, which was accomplished by IBM in 2017. And when you raise the number of qubits to just 260, the size of the classical computer you would need to simulate it would need more bits than there are atoms in the known universe. Not stars, but atoms. All right, now we have a grasp of the power of qubits. Let's now talk about what's happening with Google. Google started researching quantum computing in 2006 using hardware from Canada's D-Wave. Then, in 2014, Google hired John Martini, one of the world's most foremost experts on quantum computing. Martini spent years as the physics professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he brought his whole team with him when he was hired. So with Martini and his team, Google started developing their own quantum computing technology, and they recently unveiled their latest quantum processor, the mighty Bristol Cone. The Bristol Cone is the most powerful quantum processor by far, equipped with 72 qubits, besting IBM's 50 qubit and Intel's 49 qubit processors. Google has been secretive about the chip since they unveiled it back in March, but it seems it will be mainly be a testbed for their research for improving error rates. This is because up to this point, one of the major challenges of quantum computers is that qubits are very unstable and easily disturbed. The processors are so sensitive that even unintended sounds can cause algorithmic failure. And on top of that, the processors must be kept extremely cold, close to absolute zero. At these temperatures, atoms and molecules are more stable, lessening the chance of qubits to flip from one state to another. So to fix error rates, Google has developed a quantum error correction technique that carefully choreographs series of logic operations on the qubits to detect where errors have occurred. They applied the technique with Bristlecone's predecessor, a 9-qubit processor, achieving their best error rate of 0.6%. Although the Bristlecone's processor has eight times the qubits as its predecessor, Google strives to improve on that error rate. While Google seems to be leading the race to achieve quantum supremacy, the race spans internationally. In addition to Google, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, and various startups and academic labs, China and the EU are also competing to be the first to achieve quantum supremacy. The Chinese government has committed $10 billion to build a new national quantum lab. 
Additionally, the Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba, who are latecomers to the quantum computing development scene, completed an 11 qubit chip back in February. And they don't believe Google will achieve quantum supremacy with the Bristol cone based on their simulation of the chip using a collection of powerful servers. But Google countered these claims saying that Alibaba's simulations weren't detailed enough to be definitive. And further, Martini believes that Google will achieve quantum supremacy by the end of the year. And it will be a huge milestone for the company and the technology at large if they can pull it off. But quantum computing is bigger than the coming event of quantum supremacy. And there is the beginnings of an industry that is starting to bud. And this brings us back to Canada's D-Wave, which we touched on earlier. D-Wave was founded in 1999 and is the world's first quantum computing company. And they claim to be the leader in the development and delivery of quantum computing systems and software. Their mission is to unlock the power of quantum computing to solve the world's most challenging problems. And their systems are being used by world-class organizations and institutions, including Lockheed Martin, Google, NASA, Volkswagen, and many others. On top of that, D-Wave has been granted over 160 US patents and has published over 100 peer-reviewed papers in leading scientific journals. And in 2011, after 12 years of research, they released the world's first commercial quantum computer at a price of $10 million. But D-Wave is aggressively working towards getting quantum computing to the masses. Back in February of this year, D-Wave raised $50 million from Canada's PSP investments, and they hope to raise hundreds of millions of dollars more later this year. They aim to use this money to hire software developers to help them push their quantum computing technology to the cloud. And by sending quantum computing to the cloud, everyday developers will be able to experiment with the technology, and this will speed up research as more engineers learn how to work with the technology. You see, for quantum computing technology to become useful and become an industry, there are two areas that researchers and engineers need to work on. We have already covered the first area, which is to develop quantum computers that has close to no error rates as possible. And the second area is to simply have more people that know how to develop software for the technology. Because it's very difficult for programmers to work with today's quantum computing technology. Not only do you have to deal with error rates, you also have to deal with limited windows of time. You see, the window of time when qubits are in superpositions is very short, but technology has improved over time. Again, superposition is when qubits are in both zero and one states at the same time. Back in the late 1990s, superposition only lasted for a few nanoseconds. And a nanosecond is one billionth of a second, by the way. But by today, quantum computers are able to hold superpositions for around 90 microseconds microseconds being one millionth of a second. So there has been a huge improvement over the past 20 years. So again, there is a need to have more programmers learning how to create quantum algorithms. But D-Wave isn't the only company working towards bringing quantum computing to the masses. IBM and Microsoft are also working towards that same goal. IBM has made quantum computing available in the cloud since May 2016, starting with the five qubit computer. And they call this the IBM quantum experience. The IBM Quantum Experience has facilitated more than 60,000 users from more than 1,500 universities, 300 high schools, and 300 private institutions. And IBM has collectively run 1.7 million experiments. The members of the research community has also published more than 35 research papers using IBM's cloud platform as a testbed for ideas. But even with more researchers and engineers having access to quantum computing technology, there are still only a handful of experts that can program software for quantum computers. And this brings us to the startup company Zapata Computing. Zapata Computing was established in 2017 with the aim to commercialize software for quantum computing developed at Harvard University. The company recently raised $5.4 million, and they plan to serve as a quantum algorithm superstore and offer a broad range of ready-made software that companies and various entities can purchase or lease. By using Zapata's services, companies will be able to use quantum computing without having an in-house quantum specialist. 
And Zapata has worked out a partnership with Harvard, who has licensed algorithms that were developed at the university. It's not clear yet what algorithms will be useful in what fields, but the company will slowly build their library over time. In the meantime, Zapata will focus on algorithms for chemistry and materials, such as modeling molecules, which is difficult to do on today's best supercomputers. If Zapata is able to develop algorithms that will allow computers to model molecules, there would be an explosion of simulation data available to scientists that will ultimately lead to advances in various technologies, such as battery technology. Similar to classical computers' early days, quantum computing isn't that useful or practical yet. But let's explore some areas that experts believe will be impacted by quantum computing. Experts believe quantum computing will play a big role in the development of artificial intelligence because AI involves processing vast amounts of data in order to calculate the probabilities of a multitude of choices. Another field that experts anticipate quantum computing helping with is financial modeling. With quantum computing, scientists will be able to simulate a complex array of scenarios that are randomly generated in order to produce models of financial markets. So there's so many other fields that could benefit from harnessing quantum computing, such as weather forecasting, particle physics, autonomous vehicles, and many more. But this technology is still in its infancy, and only time will tell whether we'll be able to harness the potential of quantum computing. Many experts actually believe that classical computing will always perform better at certain tasks. Here's Professor Andrea Morello from University of South Wales to explain. The reason why quantum computers are not a replacement for classical computers. They're not? Quantum, no, they're not. They're not universally faster. They're only faster for special types of calculations where you can use the fact that you have all these quantum superpositions available to you at the same time to do some kind of computational parallelism. If you just want to watch a video in high, in high definition or browse the internet or, or write some document in Word, they're not going to give you any particular um, improvement if you need to use a classical algorithm to get to the result. So you should not think of a quantum computer as something where every operation is faster. In fact, every operation is probably going to be slower than in the computer you have on the desk. But it's an, a, a computer where the number of operations required to arrive at the result is exponentially small. Okay. So the improvement is not in the speed of the individual operation, is in the total number of operations you need to arrive at the result. But that is only the case in particular types of calculations, in particular algorithms. It's not universally the case. All right, and I would like to end this with a cool concept. Um, and that is, according to physicist Dr. Ruth Olten, whatever complex devices that we use in the future, whether it be tablets or something yet to be invented, it will likely be a hybrid computer, one with a quantum processing unit and one with a classical processor. So it looks like in the future, there will not be a battle between quantum and classical computing technology. It looks like we'll actually be using the best of what both has to offer. All right, that's all I have for now. I hope you enjoyed your journey. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. I am Neil Scribe, and I'll see you on the next journey. Hey guys, I can't wait to see quantum computing technology continue to improve. Quantum processors are so sensitive, I honestly don't see quantum computing being used outside of the cloud. It's really hard to imagine quantum chips being inside whatever devices we use in the future. But I'm hopeful the technology will be able to help with a lot of the world's problems, but my mind actually went to how cool open world video games can potentially be with the power of quantum computing. 
Imagine a future installment of Grand Theft Auto or Elder Scrolls with immersive complex worlds filled with non-player characters programmed with truly dynamic responses and reactions with memories of past events in the game which you can hear them talk about in a realistic way. Imagine characters that have dynamic loops similar to hosts on Westworld, loops that the characters will be able to adapt to when broken. That would be so cool. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next time.